For those who haven't heard yet, our family of parishes, with the concurrence of the respective parish councils, have a new name. We are the St. Gasper family of parishes. This is a distinct improvement over our previous family names, Northeast 6 and Region 7, respectively. The individual parishes in the family retain their former names, which include Emmanuel, Holy Trinity, St. Joseph, Precious Blood, St. Rita, and St. Paul. But collectively, we are the St. Gasper family of parishes. Now, many might not recognize the name of this great saint, but our parishes have been faithfully served for more than a decade now by priests and brothers from the Society St. Gasper founded in 1815, the Missionaries of the Precious Blood. Since St. Since Gasper now is quite fittingly the patron of our parish family, I thought tonight would be a great opportunity to give a brief overview of his life, as well of the spirituality and charism of the missionaries of the precious blood. I used several sources for this homily tonight, including articles written by Father Angelo, Father Schreider, Father Conti, as well as information from various precious blood websites, as well as the internet. Gaspar del Bufalo was born and raised in Rome. Born on the Feast of the Epiphany, January 6, 1786. His full name is Gaspar Melchior Balthazar, the traditional names of the Magi who visited the child Jesus. His father, Antonio, worked for a wealthy Altieri family as a chef. The del Buffalos lived in servants' quarters in the Altieri family palace. Across the street was a church that had a chapel dedicated to St. Francis Xavier. Growing up, Gasper was a sickly child and suffered from an incurable eye disease which threatened to leave him blind. His mother, though, was devoted to St. Francis Xavier and prayed for Gaspar's healing before a relic of St. Xavier in the church's chapel. Gaspar recovered from his illness and from that point on, naturally enough, had a special devotion to St. Xavier. And not surprisingly, St. Xavier is the patron of the missionaries of the precious blood. Now, even prior to his ordination, Gasper visited the sick and the poor and was very active in, or in organizing charitable activities. He was ordained in the Diocese of Rome in 1808 at the age of 22. In 1809, Napoleon Bonaparte took over Italy and imprisoned Pope Pius VII. Father Gasper, along with other clergy, heroically refused to take an oath of allegiance to Napoleon. Gasper is quoted as boldly and defiantly saying, I cannot, I must not, and I will not. For this refusal, he was sent into exile to northern Italy and imprisoned for four years. Several times during his imprisonment, he was given the opportunity to take the oath, and each time he refused. And each time he was sent to an even worse prison in an attempt to break his health and his spirit. It was during this period that Father Gasper was mentored by a Father Francesco Albertini, who was exiled and imprisoned with him. Father Albertini was the one who nurtured Gasper's devotion to the precious blood of Jesus. After Napoleon's defeat, Father Gasper returned to Rome in 1814 and threw himself into his preaching ministry. He was an eloquent preacher. His homilies were described by a bishop at the time as being like a spiritual earthquake. His focus during this time was reconciling the, those priests and faithful who had taken the oath of allegiance to Napoleon, 
reconciling them to the church. The missionaries of the Precious Blood were founded by St. Gaspar the following year in 1815, and his ministry of reconciliation through the Precious Blood of Jesus became its distinctive charism. It was a time of great lawlessness in Italy. Bandits were everywhere and had taken over entire towns. Pope Pius VII suggested that Father Gasper and his new band of missionaries go into those towns and provinces where many of the bandits live and establish mission houses. So between 1821 and 1823, six new mission houses were opened in those very areas. Gasper and his companions went out and preached the merits of the precious blood, and they called the people to repentance and to return to faithfulness. They would preach on the street corners at night. They would instruct children during the day. And armed with only a crucifix, they went into the hills where Father Gasper would negotiate peace with the bandits. His preaching was so effective that often groups of bandits were known to have come and pile their weapons at his feet. Gasper fervently preached the dignity of each person because all people have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. So great was Gasper's love for God's people that he continued to pour out his life in loving service at the expense of his own health. Toward the end of 1836, a cholera epidemic swept over the Papal States. Late in the summer of 1837, there were as many as 200 deaths a day. Gasper reached out to the victims of cholera, helping them to connect their sufferings to the sufferings of Christ. St. Gaspar's own health deteriorated, but he would not give up ministering to God's people. He died on December 28, 1837, on the Feast of the Holy Innocents. The cause of death on his death certificate reads, A Victim of Charity. He was canonized by Pope Pius XII on June 12, 1954, and though Gasper never left his homeland, he was a great missionary. His feast is celebrated on October 21st, and of special note, on January 4th, 1963, St. John XXIII visited the tomb of St. Gasper to invoke his intercession for Vatican II. The missionaries of the Precious Blood came to our diocese in December 1843 at the request of Bishop Purcell, who had made several trips to Europe to recruit missionaries for Ohio. Reverend Francis de Sales Bruner, a German Precious Blood priest, along with seven priests and seven brothers, came to serve the German-speaking Catholics in Ohio. Father Bruner's mother, Mother Maria Anna Bruner, the foundress of the Sisters of the Precious Blood, had died and entrusted her congregation to her son's leadership. The Precious Blood Sisters would soon join Father Bruner in America and establish the Sisters of the Precious Blood, first in Maria Stein, Ohio, and later their mother house moved to Dayton. The two congregations worked together for many years as one. For his part, Father Bruner established ten missionary centers throughout western central Ohio, ministering to the German-speaking immigrants. In 1850, Father Bruner, who had a great devotion to Mary, built a small red brick chapel in honor of the Sorrowful Mother in Bellevue, Ohio. The chapel soon became very popular with German Catholics in the area. It was the oldest place, it is rather, the oldest place of pilgrimage dedicated to Mary in the Midwest and the oldest Marian shrine east of the Mississippi. It continues to be staffed by missionaries of the precious blood to this very day. Canonically, the missionaries of the precious blood are a society of apostolic life, composed of secular priests and brothers who live in community. 
the members do not take vows but are held together by the bond of charity and by a promise to be fide to fidelity to the congregation of missions missionaries of the precious blood in accordance with their constitutions and statutes giving themselves entirely over to the service of god their charism is reconciliation renewal and bringing the word of god to where it is needed the most let's turn now to the spirituality of the missionaries of the precious blood which of necessity will be the barest of summaries father stack in his introduction to the book saint gaspar del buffalo the apostle of the blood of christ wrote that saint gaspar allowed the fire of christ's love expressed so profoundly in the mystery of the precious blood to transform him into a living fire of love and saint gaspar sometimes used this fire metaphor to describe divine love and quoted the words of jesus i have come to set the earth on fire and how i wish it were already blazing saint gaspar understood this fire to be the fire of our lord's love for us the precious blood of christ was a great symbol he used to draw people to a greater awareness of that love Father Schreider summed up the spirituality of the precious blood into four symbols the covenant the cross the cup and the paschal lamb the covenant is the most fundamental symbol of precious blood spirituality the special relationship between god and his people is was sealed first in the blood of lambs and bulls and later in christ's own blood this is the foundation upon which all the other symbols are built the blood of the cross takes its meaning from covenant for since saint paul's letters we learn that the blood of the cross is the means by which god reconciles the world to himself it's the means of bringing near those once who were far off in the gospel of luke it's the eucharistic cup the new covenant in Christ's blood that prefigures the eucharistic banquet in heaven through it those who have suffered are reunited with god washed clean by the blood of the lamb but these covenants are not simply reminders of how god has worked in the past they also carry with them a vision for the future in fact the covenant sealed in the blood of christ promises a different kind of future his blood is our hope the cross of christ is another prominent symbol in precious blood spirituality you may have seen father steve and father matt wearing quite large crucifixes when they were vested in their cassocks it took up almost their whole chest in fact precious blood spirituality considers the cross in a rather unique way we tend to see the cross ourselves from the perspective of a disciple witnessing our lord's crucifixion in relative safety as it were either represented in the holy mass or while contemplating his passion some 20 centuries later and to be sure this is a powerful and meaningful perspective for though utterly helpless and powerless in the eyes of the world the mercy grace and the redemption that flowed from the blood of our lord's body nailed and pierced on that cross is what saves us even so precious blood spirituality invites us to reverse this perspective to join our lord on the cross and experience the world he came to see as he saw and experienced it by doing this the all-powerful god shows us how true power can only be found in the helplessness and pain of that victim our lord on the cross it's when we take up our cross like jesus did that god is most intensely experienced among those in our society that are cast off god gathers and is gathering a new chosen people at the foot of the cross 
those newly chosen are consecrated in Christ's blood. And we meet Christ in every reproach he suffered while on the cross. It is in the vulnerability that the cross so starkly signifies that we come to understand how God sees us and our world, a world so precious to him, yet wounded in so many ways. It is in this next symbol of the precious blood spirituality, the sacred cup, the chalice, that woundedness and suffering, woundedness and blessing rather, suffering and sanctification come together. It is in the chalice of his blood that the memory of our past and our hope for the future meet. The cup offered to many is a cup of suffering, the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. The vocation of the missionaries of the precious blood is to relieve suffering when possible, but in all cases, to be a blessing and to give those who are suffering hope. In the words of Father Wertmer, the missionaries of the precious blood must be willing to be living chalices into which God pours their destiny and vocation. In giving and receiving the chalice from one another, precious blood spirituality teaches us to share each other's burdens. The final symbol is the Paschal Lamb, which represents reconciliation. The Lamb of the book of Revelation redeems those who have come through a great tribulation. He redeems them with his blood. The fact that he has made the passage from death to life allows him to lead all who are willing to go on the same path, the same restoration of life. He restores to the victims of sin and violence their dignity and their humanity leads them to a safe place where they can live in peace. This ministry of reconciliation is first and foremost an intense accompaniment of victims of sin or violence, often over a long period of time. And it's marked by a patient listening that allows the victim first to trust and then to struggle to unburden an often painful past. Next comes a sincere offering of hospitality, a welcoming offered with a graciousness that is a pure gift, with a generous abundance that allows one to consider all the new possibilities that they have in Christ. And then comes In the third stage, this reconnecting, those who are rejected or redeemed or deemed rather worthless by the world are often disconnected from any society, isolated. Reconnecting is about ending that isolation that severs trust and makes victims of violence or sin believe the lies told about them, that they're not worthy of humane treatment, that no one can rescue them that they're despicable. Violence that some have suffered strives to inculcate that lie, that hatred of self, and since that self-hatred will keep them bound in victimhood. Reconnecting proclaims the truth that we're made in the image and likeness of God and therefore of infinite value. Reconnecting recreates the bonds of trust that makes us human, and that's where reconciliation takes place. The final stage of reconciliation is commissioning. And at this stage, those who are reconciled and reconnected are called by God to follow a particular path. Those who were once victims are now able and are invited to show the same self-giving love they were shown and have experienced as a sign of God's grace and forgiveness in the world. Perhaps the simplest way to understand the spirituality of the missionaries of the precious blood is by considering the lives of the priests and brothers who have ministered to us, served us, 
brought us the sacraments and been Christ among us for the past 12 years. They have called us to be true disciples of Christ, to be saints, and to boldly proclaim the sanctifying grace of our Lord's precious blood by which God reconciles the world to himself. They have preached the gospel of reconciliation where it is needed the most and called on us to do the same. In gratitude then for them and most especially for the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, please join me in asking for the prayers of our patron saint. Saint Gaspar del Bufalo, pray for us.